Hello YouTube. Bane666 here. Welcome to Propaganda of Toxic Feminism. The series in which I expose and debunk falsehoods, misconceptions, and outright lies spread about the men's rights movement. So let's get stuck into it. Well folks, we are almost through all of Kevin Logan's the 10 worst lies spread by the men's rights movement. So without any further delay, let's get stuck into it. Number nine. False rape accusations are fucking endemic. If you ask virtually any MRA, they will tell you that false rape accusations are fucking everywhere. You can barely walk down the street without any, or indeed every woman, falsely accusing you of rape. But as with the sperm jacking, it's almost always an anecdotal story they will tell you, because it's never happened to them themselves. And this particular lie goes to the heart of the fucking ludicrous paranoia and conspiracy theory thinking that is the heart and the core of the MRM. Firstly, I'd like to present you with some statistics from both sides of the Atlantic that prove that actually it's an incredibly rare occurrence. All of the stats I'm about to give you are linked below in some incredibly important documents that if you actually care about this subject, you probably should go and read. A study done by the Crown Prosecution Service here in Britain between January of 2011 and May of 2012 found that of the 5,651 prosecutions for rape, only 35 of them were found to have been falsely accused. You'll note, Kevin uses the word, found. That makes up just 0.62%. But, of the 35 that were actually found guilty, they represent just 28.93% of all those who were referred for prosecution by the Crown Prosecution Service themselves. So, the MRM would want you to take part in the fucking false and ludicrous notion that we should focus all of our attention on this 0.62%, rather than the 98% of rapists in Britain that never saw a fucking day in a jail cell. So what Kevin is presenting here is an extremely fallacious argument. He claims that only those who are found guilty of lying are actually guilty. Yet at the same time, he claims that not only are those who have been found guilty of rape actually guilty, but that anyone who has been accused is also guilty, regardless of the verdict. In other words, he is applying two different standards of evidence, based on either his ideology or emotional involvement. Now rape is a horrendous crime so I can understand how emotions can distort facts and logic. So what I am about to present is a metaphor which removes the ideological and emotional bias and just looks at the numbers and the facts. Be Jack and Jill. They have just gained employment at a local factory that produces canned goods. The cannery produces two types of product. One is canned baked beans and the other is canned spaghetti. Unfortunately the automated labeling machine ran amok overnight, and has spat out 100 cans without labels. There is no way to tell what's in the cans, without opening them. Shaking them isn't a solution as the contents feel and sound exactly the same. And the exact same type of can, is used for both products. Unfortunately for both Jack and Jill, they are given the task on their first day of work, to sort the shit out. Jill opens six of the cans, and finds baked beans, and concludes that all the remaining cans, all 94 of them, must be baked beans. Jack on the other hand, opens 8 cans, and finds spaghetti, and concludes that all 92 of the remaining cans, must be spaghetti. And they spend the rest of the day arguing, instead of actually opening the fucking cans, and finding out. So who is right? Jack or Jill? The answer is neither. They are both idiots and should probably be fired. We can only go by what we do know, and that is that, 8% has been proven to be spaghetti, and 6% has been proven to be baked beans. The remaining 86% are unknown, because they have not been proven one way or the other. Now imagine Jill insisted that the 86 unknown cans, be labeled baked beans, and shipped out to the supermarkets. Imagine that she was adamant that the only cans, of spaghetti have already been found, and that all remaining cans, must be, by default, baked beans. I hope everyone watching can see how flawed this line of thinking would be. Because that is exactly what Kevin is arguing. He is demanding two different standards of evidence. He thinks that for a false accusation to be classed as a false accusation, it needs to be proven beyond a shadow of a doubt. 
yet for an accusation of rape to be classed as a rape, and not just an accusation, all that is needed is the accusation. And this is exactly why MRAs make such a fuss over false accusations. It's because the legal system is based on innocent until proven guilty, well at least it should be. But individuals like Kevin want to change it to, guilty until proven innocent, and even then, you are probably still guilty, right? Four men were charged with five counts of rape, and police were looking for a fifth man. The four men pleaded not guilty and were held on a half million dollar bond. If convicted, all faced up to 25 years in prison. A few days later, she recants her story. The suspects were released and the charges were dropped. The 18-year-old freshman later told officials the sexual encounter was consensual. We have three of those men that were charged and held. Let's meet them now. Jesus, Stalin, and Arvin. Now, falsely accused, right? So it definitely is not no booing matter because this is a very sensitive subject. You know what I'm saying? We came out to, came out to support Chai and we gained booze. I really didn't want to come out here and next thing you know, I have people booing me. But, you know? but I, I, and I agree with you. Why, is there a particular reason why anybody wants to say why they booed? You come to speak to the mic? I booed for a good reason. I have been sexually assaulted. And I know what it's like. It's not cool. And if you guys are lying about it, that's not right. I know what it's like. It's not cool. Basically, the story is recanted, so... Did you have sex with this young thing is, to the young lady, um, I'm Stalin Felipe, by the way. Um, I apologize that you've been assaulted before. That's not all fault. But I do apologize for that matter. But there was a video that proved that the sex was consensual. And she even said herself that it was all a lie. She actually lied because she was called by her boyfriend. So she told him to lie to let you her know what? her I'm, I'm, I'm... Hi. All right, so honestly, I'm torn right now, and I don't know whether or not I believe you guys. And apparently this video is what's going to save you. But you said you took it on a phone, so how long did the video last? 40 seconds, 50 seconds? Who is to say that those two guys that are having sex with her, four more didn't join in? Um, like how if if it, if if it, it was a lie, we wouldn't be here right now. Yeah. The girl, the girl, <laughs> the girl has recanted the story. The story. She, she's, she said, she. I mean, I'm just. It's. She admitted that she didn't want her boyfriend to find out. And That's why she made up the story. Maybe she's scared that if she says that she was raped. How, how scared? Wait, 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 wait. How, how, how scared is she than us? We was doing 25 years, so how, how much scared of she can be with us? We do 25 years, so what are we scared about? <laughs> of course, this is a standard only applied to men, or should I say, other men, as no doubt if Kevin was falsely accused of rape, he would demand his innocence unless proven guilty, and no doubt wouldn't think, at least in that particular case, that the accusation is all that's needed. I also wonder that if someone claimed to Kevin that they had been abducted and raped by aliens, would he automatically believe them or apply the appropriate level of skepticism unless they produced tangible evidence? What if a close female friend of Kevin's was accused of being a child molester? Would he automatically think she was guilty as accused or withhold judgment until she was proven guilty? Innocent until proven guilty is an extremely important concept, one that feminism wants to throw under the proverbial bus, well at least in the case of men. And being skeptical of a claim until you have seen the evidence should be everyone's default setting. We know that some females lie about rape, not all, not most, but some. Kevin even acknowledges this. For the simple reason, it's ludicrous to assume that all accusations are positive until proven otherwise. MRAs aren't demanding that rapists go free, or that rape doesn't happen. We are simply asking for the same standard of evidence that is required in other cases. We are supporting the legal cornerstone of, innocent until proven guilty. And we are discouraging modern day witch trials.
Which may we burn, huh? Burn her! Burn her! Burn her! Who'd you know she is a witch? She looks like one! Yeah, she looks like one! That Monty Python clip is closer to modern day reality than you might think. Because now you don't actually have to commit rape to be punished for it, you just have to look like a rapist. From the National Review. By Catherine Timph. Student banned from areas of campus for resembling classmates rapist. A student at a liberal arts school in Oregon was reportedly banned from going anywhere on campus that a fellow student would be, because he looked like the person who had raped her. Professor Janet Halley wrote in a piece for Harvard Law Review that she had, recently assisted, a student who had been, ordered to stay away from a fellow student, cutting him off from his housing, his campus job, and educational opportunity, all because he reminded her of the man who had raped her months before and thousands of miles away. The accused also had to endure, a month-long investigation into all his campus relationships, seeking information about his possible sexual misconduct in them which she called an immense invasion of his and his friend's privacy. And believe it or not, it gets worse. Even after this invasive investigation completely cleared him of any wrongdoing, he still wasn't allowed to go anywhere where the student would be without risking punishment from the school. The stay-away order remained in place, and was so broadly drawn up that he was at constant risk of violating it and coming under discipline for that. The piece continues. <laughs> She is a witch. She looks like one. So we need to ask ourselves a very serious question. Do we want a legal system built on justice, or built on moral panic? Are we going to allow the courts to determine verdicts, or mob rule? One is an imperfect system, but the other is a slippery slope into the abyss. Next. Really, that's the big issue you want to focus on. It shows really where the sympathies of the MRM are. It's not with people who are getting raped, either men or fucking women. It's with rapists. They love the rapists. I think what Kevin means is, accused rapists. Right, Kevin? Or should we just take anyone accused of rape out the back and shoot them in the head, without so much as a trial? Next. Now moving over the Atlantic to our American cousins, there is a study linked below in the description box that suggests that false rape accusations range between 2 and 8%, although other statistics would suggest that it's actually at the lower end of that scale. Now even if it were 8%, which is the top of that range, it would still pale in insignificance to the 98% of men who do not face justice for rape. 98% of men who don't face justice for rape? Based on this particular number, I would guess that this includes unreported rapes. Of course these actual figures are unknown. They could be higher than reported, or they could be much lower, it's impossible to say considering they tend to come from surveys, many of which are questionable. But regardless of the actual number of unreported rapes, all unreported rapes have one thing in common. They are unreported. And if they are unreported, we can hardly expect there to be a trial, conviction, or punishment. But what about those rapes that are reported? Well, they don't always end in a conviction, this may be because the accused is innocent, or he may be guilty, but there just isn't enough evidence for a conviction. Of course, Kevin considers all these men guilty, including those who have been found innocent, and those in the unreported category that possibly don't even exist. It seems that Kevin doesn't understand the words, accused, or, not guilty, or the concept of, innocent until proven guilty. Which is why we should never let his kind near the legal system. But sadly it's already too late. Next. Being that the rape of a woman, or the rape of a man. The MRM will occasionally bring up the ludicrous notion that 41% of those that are prosecuted for rape are actually being falsely accused. Now this comes from the Jan Jordan study in 2004. So far Kevin has put forward 2%, 8% and now, 41%. Megan McCardle in her article for the Bloomberg View, called, How Many Rape Reports Are False, covers these figures. A lot of statistics are floating around the internet, 2%, say many feminists, the same as other crimes. 25%, say other groups who quarrel with the feminists on many issues, or maybe 40%. Here's the real answer, we don't know. Anyone who insists that we do know should be corrected or ignored. Here's what we do know, the 2% number is very bad and should never be cited. 
It apparently traces its lineage back to Susan Brown Miller's legendary, Against Our Will, and her citation for this figure as a single speech by an appellate judge before a small group of lawyers. His source for this statistic was a single area of New York that started having police women conduct all rape interviews. This is not data. It is an anecdote about an anecdote. The 41% number beloved of men's rights activists is better. It involves a peer-reviewed study by Eugene Cannon of a police department in some unknown small city. False reports could only be declared if the victim herself withdrew the charge. However, we're talking about one city, in which 109 rapes were examined over a period of nine years. As feminists point out, victims might have withdrawn the charges simply because they found it too traumatic to engage with the police department, not because the accusation was false and the study itself is now pretty elderly. A lot has changed in 20 years, including, possibly, the number of false rape accusations in the city and the rest of the nation. This number should be used only with grave caution. But so should any other numbers, such as the 8% figure that is commonly attributed to the FBI. When you dig into the research itself, you find it is often heavily inflected with the author's prior beliefs about what constitutes the real problem, unreported cases of rape or false reports. So Cannon is frequently chided for accepting the results of a police department investigation that included offering the victims a polygraph, because this is intimidating for true victims as well as women making false reports, and it could raise the incidence of false negatives. On the other hand, if the rate of false rape reports is quite high, much higher than that of other crimes, then this might be a reasonable precaution. It's possible that by encouraging police departments not to polygraph rape victims, we have fixed a cruel system in which innocent victims are bullied into recanting. It's also possible that we've increased the number of false accusations that proceed to investigation and conviction. So we simply don't know the real number, which is why every claim should be investigated, and the accused should be considered innocent until proven guilty in a court of law. We should have the presumption of innocence not the assumption of guilt. Next. And for those that don't know, Jan Jordan is actually a feminist and is the Deputy Director of the Institute of Criminology at the University of Wellington in New Zealand. And they are referring to her 2004 study into attitudes of the New Zealand police force towards rape. Now the MRM have misrepresented her findings as badly as if you were to suggest that Dr Pepper was actually a medical practitioner. Now, in her study, there were 161 instances of claimed rapes, only 13 of which were definitely false rape accusations. The numbers were basically around the police's attitudes towards the victims. Basically, she found that the police were massively more sceptical of the person making the claim than of the rapists themselves. The police's default position should always be scepticism, while they are collecting data and evidence. Imagine I went to the police and claimed that Kevin had stolen my car. Should they then kick his door in and demand he give it back? Or might it be wise to ask me a series of questions, designed to gather information, before determining what happened? Asking these questions isn't harassment, and it doesn't mean they are accusing me of lying. It simply means they are trying to determine the truth. And no doubt, they would ask similar questions of Kevin. Once again, not to harass him, or accuse him of lying, but to determine the truth or at very least collect evidence for a court case. Now I can understand that if someone has just been raped, being asked a series of questions might be traumatic. But it's still a necessity. And realistically no different than many other scenarios. You think they don't ask mugging victims what happened? Next. Some of the reasons given were ridiculous, such as the police found the person was immoral or that they would have been drinking or taking drugs, or that the person had had consensual sex with the individual beforehand, or that they've been suffering from a mental illness. Sound familiar? Although I might agree with Kevin that the immoral claim is unacceptable. Some of the other things mentioned are reasonable questions to ask. For example, if someone is drunk or on drugs, they are possibly not going to make a credible witness. This does not mean they deserve to be raped or that they are lying. But it does mean their recollection may be inaccurate, or at very least called into question. A similar thing can be said about mental illness, depending on the mental illness in question, 
and the particular circumstances of the case. This does not necessarily mean that the police in question were uncaring and human monsters. Next. Actually, the study suggests that far from the MRM's actual contention, there isn't a massive problem with false rape accusations, but there is a massive problem with the police essentially being more sceptical of someone making a claim than of people being fucking rapists. Accused rapists, Kevin. I think you meant to say, accused rapists. Next. Which brings me on to my final point, which is that the men's rights movement is never more disgusting than when it seeks to piggyback on actual issues that men face. The statistics linked below say that one in every 33 American men will be raped at some point in his life. Actually, that figure is much higher if you include forced envelopment, which at this point isn't considered rape. Of course, this is a major MRA talking point that seems to be totally ignored by feminists. Next. Well, the MRM don't actually care about that. And rates of underreporting of male rape are actually worse, seemingly, than that of women. But this is partly due to the alpha male bullshit that's still spread by fuckers in the manosphere. It is feminists who are trying to get rid of those kind of gender roles. So if you want to help men who have been raped, you should be a feminist, not a fucking ridiculous bullshit fucking sexist in the manosphere. Really, Kevin? Following Shia LaBeouf's sexual assault by a woman, Megan Murphy of Feminist Current wrote, Why are we supposed to believe Shia LaBeouf? From the article, but to say that, believing male victims, is a, feminist imperative, isn't actually true. As some feminist writers have pointed out, this kind of analysis fails to understand or acknowledge what feminism actually does. Feminism explicitly and necessarily is about understanding the fact that, and the way in which, men, as a class, oppress women, as a class. There is no equivalency in rape because men and women do not share similar experiences of gender oppression, because men do not, in fact, experience oppression because of their gender, women do. I'm sure that would encourage male victims to come forward, right Kevin? By telling them that their victimhood isn't a feminist imperative, because, you know, patriarchy. And then Amala Dunno doesn't waste any time getting to the point, in her article, Believing Men Is Not, a Feminist Imperative, on Root Veg. The picture we get here is that he remained inert to maintain the integrity of his art, while a woman proceeded to, rape, him. Given that women cannot actually rape men, the collective interpretation of this event is that the woman somehow made him penetrate her. Did you hear that Kevin, this feminist thinks women cannot rape men, she even uses talking marks around the word, rape. I guess she must be suffering from a dose of toxic masculinity from the manosphere, right Kevin? She goes on to say, The recent trend in treating men and women as equivalent sexual actors, and women as sexual aggressors, dovetails with liberal, equality, politics and the erasure of sex differences between men and women. The fact is, however, that penetration is very much a one-way street, and the roles of penetrator and penetratee are profoundly different in terms of material power and impact. This difference underpins a feminist analysis of rape. It is how rape, aka penile penetration, is used by men to control the free movement and behavior of women in every single society on earth. The converse scenario where women oppress men as a group with the act of forced envelopment has literally never happened, and it never could. Can we envisage a world where men are hasty to get home before dark, lest a woman force him to fuck her? Do we think a society has ever existed where men's typical concern when left alone with a woman has ever been that he is vulnerable to being enveloped by her? If not, why not? Do we think a woman who has been raped while drunk by a drunk man technically raped him too? If not, why not? We lack explanatory answers to any of these questions if we genuinely entertain the position that penetrator and penetratee are equivalent. This sex-based power differential bleeds into all relations between the sexes, and it is the very foundation of women's oppression. This is why, when the article asks, would we ask the same questions of a woman? The answer is a very obvious, no. Because women are not, in fact, the same as men. To pretend otherwise elides reality and functions to the detriment of women. 
so it's pretty clear that some feminists only see the world through the lens of patriarchy, where all men by default are oppressors, and all women by default are oppressed. When this worldview is adopted, it becomes impossible to see, acknowledge, or empathize with male victims. Or at least male victims of females. Male victims of other males can always be used to further demonize masculinity, right? But all talk of female victimizers is blasphemy. But to be fair, not all feminists are like this, for example, from Hekati Papadaki's article titled, Shia LaBeouf Was Raped? You Must Be Kidding, published on Huffington Post. The more I think about it, the more similar cases I remember. There was, for instance, my male friend at uni who was in a long-distance relationship with a girl who rung a dozen times a day to check up on him. When he flew home over the holidays on an overnight flight, she bullied him into having sex as soon as he walked through the door, then bullied him even worse for being too tired to become aroused. Another friend's girlfriend signed him out of hospital on the same day he'd removed his appendix to take him home and have sex. Then there were the girls in my school who sneaked into the boys' toilets and made fun of boys' genitals. When I discussed these events with male friends, they weren't surprised. Some relayed worse experiences of their own. And yet of all my male friends, only one openly recognized that he'd been sexually abused by women. According to the Office of National Statistics, only 0.3% of men in the UK experience sexual violence each year, but judging by the experiences of men in my social cycle, that statistic sounds improbable. A 2012 literature review estimated that 19-31% to 31 of US male college students experienced some kind of unwanted sexual contact. The problem is, gender norms are so fixed that we refuse to recognize male victims of sexual violence just as we refuse to identify female perpetrators. As a woman, I was taught from a very early age that men are always after sex, the same way I was taught that sex is not a primary drive for women. Ridiculous as both these statements sound, they are still inscribed on our social psyche. A few years ago, I was undertaking domestic violence training. The trainer, a woman with years of experience in the field, delivered an in-depth analysis of the different types of domestic abuse and how these affect women. She took pains to explain how emotional abuse could be just as devastating and stressed over and over that the drive for male to female domestic violence is the perverse belief of ownership of the victim. It wasn't until about 10 minutes before the course ended that she acknowledged that men too could be victims in fact, 40% of DV victims are male. According to her, though, the male experience was different because men suffered more from hurt feelings due to loss of entitlement than they did from the actual abuse. That statement, dismissive and biased as it was, carries some truth. The emotional experience of male victims is indeed different to that of female victims. Men are not entitled to victimhood, and especially not in the case of sexual abuse. Male sexuality is defined by dominance over the female. By becoming victims, men's entire gender identity is questioned. In the same way, female gender norms do not allow space for sexual predation. We cannot reconcile female to male sexual violence with the rigid gender norms we are brought up to believe. Growing up, I was repeatedly told that, good, men were an exception, in a family dominated by an angry father. As a child, I was never told that women were also capable of abuse. For example, no one explained that my grandmother had been an equal source of terror for my dad. Instead, I was brought up to believe that men are prone to violence, likely to be untrustworthy and dangerous. For my brother, growing up in this environment meant he was assigned an added burden of guilt by virtue of his gender. So no Kevin, this isn't the fault of the manosphere. There are many feminists who are just as bad at reinforcing gender stereotypes, well at least the negative ones about males. But isn't it interesting that Kevin used the term manosphere? Because the manosphere is a vast group of different ideas and philosophies, of which the MRM only makes up a small portion. And if any group in the manosphere acknowledges and tries to help male victims, it's the men's rights movement. Next. They want to be taken seriously in the discussion of right. But when you have leading figures like Paul Lamb coming out and saying that women are basically begging to get raped if they dress a certain way, or they go out and consume alcohol. 
Now let's flip that back on them and say, let's use their mentality about men who get raped in prison. A man walks into a shower naked around other naked, sexually frustrated men and begins to lather himself in soap and rub himself sensually around men who are obviously going to be very sexually frustrated. Is he asking to get raped? No, of course he fucking isn't. Nobody asks to get raped. There is somewhat of a distinction between the two scenarios presented by Kevin here. One involves someone going out of her own free will, consuming too much alcohol, and putting herself in a situation where someone could take advantage of her. The other, is a guy who is placed in a situation against his will. One is in a place of her choice, and drunk. The other is sober, but not in a place of his choosing. In other words, these are very different situations. Having said that though, neither deserve to be raped. Although I have heard many people say male prisoners deserve to be raped, many times. As for the drunk woman scenario, I would advise anyone, male, female, trans, or whatever, to be cautious when out and intoxicated. Although it's unlikely males would be the victim of a violent rape in this scenario, being blind drunk out in public does dramatically increase your chances of being the victim of violence. It also increases your chances of walking into oncoming traffic, or falling off balconies, or some other stupid shit that could get you hurt or killed. I would advise everyone not to drink beyond the point of self-control, or awareness of your surroundings, unless you have someone somewhat sober to look out for you. That's not rape apology, it's common sense. Next. Yet that is still the contention of many in the MRA, because essentially, I get the impression there are a lot of very guilty consciences in that movement, and that's why they focus on false rape allegations, because essentially, it's the one bullet in the fucking firing squad. They all want to pretend that they aren't fucking rapists. And so they- Oh no, Kevin just jumped the shark. But don't worry, it gets even worse in number 10 on his list. The worst is yet to come. But I find it interesting that Kevin would throw around the rapist allegation so easily. Because it's a pretty fucking serious accusation, even if you were just using it as an insult. And it also shows what a complete hypocrite Kevin is, after all at the start of his video he says, Male feminists such as myself can expect to hear words like mangina, castrati, pussy chaser and white knight. Any and all of these phrases can be thrown by simple-minded idiots in the MRM to try and smear anyone who disagrees with them on any point whatsoever. Okay, just so we are clear. It's wrong to call an individual a mangina, but it's perfectly acceptable to label an entire movement rapists? No hypocrisy there. Next. Piggyback on men's issues. And actually, what do they do? Fuck all. If you want to help men out, what you should be is a feminist, because feminists have actually done some fucking concrete things to try and improve the lives of men. TEN! The men's rights movement is a human rights movement. One example of which would be the human right to bodily integrity, something males throughout the world do not have. And this is exemplified in the fact that guys like Paulie Lamb, the founder of A Voice for Men, a fucking joke of a title for a joke of a website, has started referring to the MRM as the MHRM, the Men's Human Rights Movement. But actually, when you look at it, everything they do, and most of the things they stand for, contradict that. For instance, they rarely lobby politicians and policymakers in order to try and make a positive change to laws. Which takes time, money, manpower, and community awareness. Unfortunately feminists like Kevin are determined to stand in our way, and stop us at any cost, including spreading lies and propaganda about us. We are a grassroots movement, which is competing against the juggernaut of feminism, which has influence in the education system, the media, and government. Feminism has also been at this a lot longer. So to put it simply, feminism is the establishment, and we are the underdogs. But it won't be that way forever. Trust me on that one, Kevin. Next. They conduct very little, or no, original research into the topics they claim to give a fuck about. And here Kevin ignores the infection of the education system by feminism. Unfortunately, if research isn't in line with feminist ideology, it's likely to be attacked. Next. They don't offer legal counsel or assistance to men who they claim have been wronged by the law. Greetings, Internet. I was at the Nicholas Alavardian rally, 
And for those of you that don't know, Nicholas Alaverdian is a lobbyist and a youth advocate that was falsely accused of sexual assault and was denied a jury trial by Judge Carl Henderson. And I was there to help out, make some signs, help speak out, help. Uh, I did some minute keeping for the speakers, and I got a chance to actually sit down and interview Nicholas. Now, the reason I brought this topic up with Nicholas in the first place was because I wanted to present uh, publicize his case in a class on media literacy on my campus, Kennesaw State University, and I wanted to use his case as an example of uh, court biases against men and boys. And his case is pretty uh, is pretty interesting because when I, we were over there at the rally, the big thing that Nicholas needed to do was actually go out and file a motion for a jury trial. And should the motion be denied, he'll have a capacity to, you know, take the case to higher and higher courts. And if he takes the case to higher and higher courts, and should he actually get the jury trial he needs, he will set a precedent from in a very high court that will spill over into other courts and will actually help men and boys because judges will not be uh, so ready to toss away men's rights. So this is a very big case, and if you do not understand Nicholas's story, I highly encourage you to go to his site in the low bar, go ahead and read the court documents, court transcript, and all that. You'll learn about the parties involved, and you'll learn just how much hell a single accusation can cause a man. And they don't produce policy documents and distribute them so they can engage in the wider social and political discussion. Also, if they want to be taken seriously as a human rights campaigning movement, they should really try and dissociate themselves from stuff like this. Kevin now presents evidence as to why the men's rights movement is so evil. So considering his track record of falsely associating non-MRAs with MRAs, let's keep count. I posted this image to my Tumblr a few days ago. It's a picture of myself looking rather angry, holding a sign reading, I am the other hundreds of thousands of people who died today other than Amanda fucking Todd. Oh no, not the amazing atheist. Unfortunately for Kevin, the amazing atheist isn't an MRE. Next. You're a nigger. And you know you're a nigger. Oh no, not Davis Arini. Unfortunately for Kevin, Arini is not an MRE. Next. It's gotten to the point where I'm more inclined to believe in conspiracy theories than to believe a woman's, especially an American woman's, public rape allegation. I'm more inclined to believe that Barack Obama's birth certificate is fake, that fluorine is a chemical used to control my mind, and that 9-11 was an inside job by George Bush. Oh no, not Roosh V. Unfortunately for Kevin, Roosh V is a pickup artist, and not an MRE. Next. If we look at the symbol down in the corner, we see it belongs to Luca Peel, who, as I showed last video, made a video exposing Julian Blank and his real social dynamics bullshit. This video is of pickup artists, not men's rights activists. Next. Women in our culture have become the most decadent sluts since the fall of Rome. Okay, so Arini yet again. Kevin really isn't doing too good here, is he? Next. If you dress and act erotically, if you put on the body language of foreplay, the strong eye contact, the tactile touching, if you telegraph such information, but actually have no interest in such things, you are increasing the chances that someone will misread the signs as interest or sexual initiation or so on. In non-body language terms, it's the equivalent of saying that you'll buy someone dinner at a very nice, very expensive restaurant, and then when the bill comes saying, well, I didn't actually mean that, I just enjoyed seeing the gratitude in your eyes, and you thought, I thought you were special enough to take you to this really nice restaurant. But for the record, how would that make you feel if it happened to you? Be clear, and above all, be honest 
with your body language. And this will probably reduce the chances of you ending up in situations where there have been miscommunications. And here we have Thunderfoot, who, you guessed it, isn't a fucking MRE. Are you noticing a pattern here, folks? Next. Okay, so I remember the story from last year. Once again we have pickup artist Julian Blank. Not doing very well, are you Kevin? Next. We entered into a workforce that Grog so aptly described as lesbianized. And Orini, yet again. Next. Exactly like, okay, I could say this, 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 okay? I also have like autopilots on hand. Like when I'm pulling, I have like all these little words where I'm like, after party, adventure, now, it makes it better, it makes it sexier. Don't worry about it, irrelevance, after party, adventure, now, don't worry about your friends, two seconds, around the corner, we'll be right back, your friends will know you're gone, tell them you're going to the bathroom, text your friend, after party, adventure, my friend's party, adventure, after party, now, it makes it sexier, don't worry, it's okay, irrelevant, now, after party, it's like, like I have that on a like bullets, like that, okay? Like, I, I have that on autopilot, okay? Like, do you guys have something like that on autopilot? If you're not on top of that, if you're not, like, even trying to cut her thoughts before they come in, like, if I'm like, let's go, the girl's probably gonna say some bull excuse. I'm like, irrelevant, before she even says it, okay? Once again, more footage of pickup artist Julian Blank. Come on, Kevin. Next. That we would just look at a woman who's, who's sitting there, maybe tears running down her cheeks, saying, um, I'm pregnant. Uh, and for the guy to be able to say, well, fuck you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, Kevin has shown an actual MRE. But the clip is edited out of context. So let's compare the original to Kevin's version. It is a bit of a long clip, but it's important for context. So let me ask you something, Tom. There is, a, I think, uh, in me, uh, I would bet in you, and in most men, there is still, despite the fact that I can't find a rational argument against this, I can't, no matter how hard I try. I, I, I don't think a team of Harvard attorneys can really find a rational argument for this, given what, are, what we consider concepts like equality under the law and things like that. If you take those things into account, then you cannot conclude that it's, it's at all constitutional or fair to make a man responsible for a child, whether he has a say in it or not. That's just indentured servitude. Um, but there is still, you know, in myself personally, and I think in most men, even though the logic of this is absolutely impeccable, and even though men are supposed to be logical creatures that make rational decisions, there is still this little uh, at the idea that we would just look at a woman who's, who's sitting there, maybe tears running down her cheeks, saying, um, I'm pregnant, uh, and for the guy to be able to say, well, fuck you. Right. Um, and, and that is pretty much what I'm advocating here, that men should have the right to do. Yes. Uh, whether it's nice or friendly or not, but they're still part of us, and I think that's part of what keeps this crazy system alive. What do you think that is in men, that, that where they can see something that is obviously logical and then still have this, this reservation, this sadness, guilt, shame about pursuing what really makes sense? As you can see, not only is the clip totally out of context, but it's actually two clips edited together. If you have to resort to this type of thing, then you really are nothing but a dishonest arsehole. But Kevin may not be entirely to blame for this one, as apparently he got this clip, and an upcoming one, from Sale Polani, aka Diana Boston, aka Man Cheese. So it's very likely that Kevin is unaware that this clip is both out of context, and is actually two clips edited together. But then again, I'm guessing he probably doesn't even care. Not too good so far Kevin, up to this point you have shown only one MRA, and dirty tricks had to be used to make it sound sinister. But Kevin has more evidence yet to present. Next. 
But it gets even worse. Not only are they associating and promoting the evil that you've just seen, they are actively working to undermine the human rights that are already in place. One of the people describes euthanasia as abortion's evil, evil twin. And that if we have a country that's totally fine with killing the unborn, what point are we going to get to when it becomes economically okay to kill people that are quote unquote useless to society? Oh no. Are you fucking serious, Kevin? Seriously, mate? It's at this point I'm actually thinking he might be just a po. That he might actually be just taking the piss. But the sad truth is, I've seen enough of his channel to know he's actually fucking serious. Unbelievable. In case you missed it, the clip you just witnessed is from InfoWars. Fucking InfoWars. Are you serious Kevin? Please mate, please tell us all that you are really just a po. Surely you cannot be that fucking incredibly stupid. Seriously mate. How do you even dress yourself? Of course. Alternatively he could just be an incredibly dishonest piece of shit. Oh, and for the record Kevin, Infowars is not part of the men's rights movement. Next. This gay marriage nonsense is a bunch of nonsense. At this point, do I even need to say it? Arini is not an MRE. But I find it interesting Kevin would use this clip. You see, I'm in favor of gay marriage. Personally I think marriage is an outdated concept, at least as it is at the moment, but I think anyone should be able to get married, if they wish. And yes Kevin, that includes gay and lesbian couples. It's their lives, their choice. But I wonder if Kevin knows that Sale Polani, who he seems rather friendly with, is a trans-exclusionary radical feminist. If you want to talk about bigots mate, you need to check your own backyard. Next. We've been sold a lie, folks, and here's what the lie is. We've been told that a, an abortion is a woman's right to choose. It all falls on the woman. She's the one that gets to decide. Well, I'm here to tell you today that abortion is a man's issue. I'll say that again because some of you are slow to hear. Abortion is a man's issue. And as long as we continue to hide, I'm talking to men now, as long as we continue to hide behind the fact that the society would tell us that it's a woman's issue, then more and more children are going to die. But I'm going to tell you what's even worse than that. Not only do children die at the abortion clinic, but a part of a woman dies at an abortion clinic. So you may be wondering who this guy is. I know I was. I noticed the cross on his hat and thought, is Kevin trying to pass an anti-abortion preacher off as an MRA? This isn't a joke either, this is actually a clip in Kevin's video. So I looked the guy up on the net, and I was right, he's an anti-abortion Christian preacher. From his website, called, Pass the Salt Ministries. Coach is using his knowledge of education and educational issues to equip Christians to defend the Judeo-Christian worldview. A popular, high-energy speaker. Coach Dalvin Meyer's motivational lectures laced with scripture are challenging Americans all across the country. Do I need to say it? Do I really need to say it? Do I really need to say that this guy has nothing to do with men's rights? I doubt he's ever even heard the term. And for the record, I'm an atheist who believes in pro-choice. I actually have more in common with Kevin than Coach Dalvin Meyer. Well not Kevin's incredulity or his blatant disregard for the truth. But at least in terms of religion and abortion. And when it comes to the topics of religion and abortion, there is no set standard in the MRM. Some of us are atheists, some are Christian, some are Muslim, some are pagan, and going by the growing movement in India, I'm guessing there are a hell of a lot of Hindus. As for abortion, some of us are pro-choice, some are anti-abortion due to religion. Others are anti-abortion due to ethical beliefs, and I'm guessing many probably don't care one way or another. But for Kevin to try to paint us all as some kind of right-wing anti-abortion Christians is extremely dishonest. Or incredibly ignorant. You know, I'm not sure which one is worse, this one or the Infowars clip. Either way Kevin, you should really be embarrassed. 
So if I had to guess, I'd say his next clip is either Hitler, or Orini, yet again. Let's find out. Next. I am personally opposed to the practice of abortion. I find it a very tragic affair. Oh, another Paul Ellum clip. Let's compare it to the original. And by the way, as we go along here, I want to remind everybody, we're not here to have a discussion of abortion rights. Um, uh, that is what, regardless of how you feel about it, and I'll go ahead and, and just give away the personal information. I am personally opposed to the practice of abortion. I find it a very tragic affair. I find it unfortunate, to, particularly for the child, also unfortunate for the mother, but I am not of a mind that I would criminalize abortion because I do not believe that that is a solution to the problem. I think there are some problems in life that you could only do as well as you can do with, with damage management uh, and that criminalizing certain behaviors, just like we see with this god-awful war on drugs, again my opinion, um, is that what you end up is throwing a bunch of people in prison and still having a society that's saturated with drugs. It's absolutely insane. So once again we have a Paul Allen clip, edited out of context, to make it sound like he wants to make abortion illegal. Which clearly is not the case. Remember Kevin prefaced these clips by claiming that MRAs are trying to take away existing rights. Paul clearly states the opposite, he clearly says he wouldn't criminalize it, but he is personally against it. Note the word, personally, he is speaking for himself, not the movement. Making Kevin's claim 100% incorrect. Next. Dogs! Halfwits! Bunglers! Okay. I admit it, I added that last one as a joke. But let's be honest here, Skeletor is more believable as an MRA than InfoWars guy, or the anti-abortion preacher. And let's face it, Snake Mountain would be a great place to hold our monthly patriarchy meetings. And Skeletor does have that whole skull thing going for him, you know, like some other incredibly talented guy. Hi everyone, how's it going? My name is Mundane Matt. Actually, I was talking about myself. But Matt's pretty talented too. Moving on. So clearly, not only are they not a human rights movement, they are actually an anti-human rights movement. Really? And Kevin makes this judgment based on a bunch of clips from non-MREs, and two deceptively edited clips of one actual MRE. Really Kevin? You sure you don't want to rethink this mate? Because your position isn't looking good. Even if we leave aside the misogyny, racism and homophobia and all the other bigotries that are engaged in by people within the men's rights movement Examples of which you are yet to give They still actually don't do anything to help men There are issues that men face in the modern world But these fuckers aren't helping Feminists have helped in the past and continue to help now So in conclusion If you want to be a men's rights activist As in someone who actively fights for men's rights You should be a feminist Just an update before moving on Yesterday when I was working on this section of this video, with a first Paul Allen clip, I left this message for Kevin. Hey Kevin. Just wondering mate if you are aware that the first Paul Allen clip you use, in number 10, which you got from Manchies, is actually two separate clips edited together and out of context? I'm guessing you used it without realizing so I thought I'd give you a chance to be on record. Care to comment? And to Kevin's credit he replied. I did not know that. I will edit that bit out when I get the chance. So let me just state here, I give Kevin full credit for this, as some people would have just ignored it, or doubled down and replied with denial and abuse. It does however, also mean that the two actual MRA clips used in part 10, can now be removed. As one was edited out of context, and the other was not only edited out of context, but was actually two clips edited together to mislead. Thus making the total for number 10 on Kevin's list, 12 non-MREs, and 0 actual MREs. And please, no one blame Kevin for the Paul Allen clips, I'm confident it was all man cheese is doing. Although Kevin should have been more careful sourcing his information, when making such serious allegations against a group. After all, he did imply we were all rapists. If you are going to make such serious allegations mate, I don't think it's too much to ask that you actually get your facts right. 
And if you are going to criticize the men's rights movement, do you think you could actually use men's rights activists as your examples? You might also want to listen to our point of view on particular topics, instead of assuming you know what we think, based on unfounded stereotypes. And finally, you might want to apply the same level of criticism to your own side, because although not all feminists are bad, there is definitely some bigoted and toxic shit going on, on your side of the fence. Well that's it for Kevin's top 10 list. I actually enjoyed going through it. Although my arms are tired from shoveling all that bullshit. So until next time folks, always remember, don't drink the poison Kool-Aid. Oh, and never use man cheese as a source, ever. Uh, there's a case of a man who was in a coma in a hospital, and a nurse mounted him, uh, got his body to respond, because this can happen. You can stimulate a, a body in a coma, and it can have a sexual reaction. She got him to have an erection, mounted him in his hospital bed, got herself pregnant. He comes out of the coma a couple of years later, and she, she sues him for child support and wins. Um, this is the kind of results that we get from these kinds of laws. And the only cure to that kind of just blatant abuse, it is using the legal system in the most disgusting and corrupt way imaginable, is for men to have reproductive rights. And that means, see ya, wouldn't want to be ya, your baby, your choice, my wallet, my choice, your body, your responsibility. If we're going to hand you the reins over your life and over the life of a child, then we shouldn't necessarily hand you the reins over the life of a third person. Um, simply because, what is it, that Tom, that men are called in a lot of these cases when they don't want to be enfranchised? They're called sperm donors, right? As though they're biological necessities that don't really count. Right. right? Sperm and money donors, don't forget. Yeah. Yeah, not fathers. Yeah. So yeah. let me ask you something, Tom. There is, a, I think, uh, in me, uh, I would bet in you, and in most men, there is still, despite the fact that I can't find a rational argument against this, I can't, no matter how hard I try.